So you're in process. I have I like literally smashed you to smithereens yesterday. I know. I challenged you. I brought you to the Jordan. And today I want you to understand the depth of what God is doing in you. Every single one of us here are here because we mean business with God. You don't join a school of ministry because it's the coolest thing to do. You join a school of ministry because you want to go deeper with God. You mean business with God. And you'll pay any price God requires of you. You'll go where he sends go. I mean, you'll whine, but you'll still go. Because that is the nature of the call. We sometimes have to be dragged there kicking and screaming, but we'll still go. See, that's what separates you from everybody else. The others will just kick and scream. But afterwards, you'll actually go. And it's like, we'll do it. We'll do it. But the hardest part is understanding the why. Why am I facing these pressures? Why do I feel like I'm hitting brick wall after brick wall? When God calls you deeper, calls you higher, you have all these ideas of how you think he's going to bring it to pass. And when you start experiencing those trials, the enemy comes upon you with so many doubts. You decide you're going to join a school of ministry because you're going to be sent. You're going to be used. I promise you the first thing that's going to happen is your finances are going to be attacked. Something's going to come up in your family. Somebody's going to get sick. Something's going to happen in your circumstance. And the first thing you're going to think is, whoa, did I miss God? Did I make a mistake here? No, ladies and gentlemen, you've just begun a process And it's not all the devil. You see, we recognize spiritual warfare very well. This is a ministry that is strong on deliverance. So we recognize spiritual warfare. But what we don't recognize is the process that the Father takes us through. The discipline He's taking us through to make us into those vessels that He can use. And when you don't get what he's doing, you begin to doubt. You doubt your process. You doubt your gifts. You doubt your place. And right there, in that moment, Satan has the perfect environment to plant his seeds. And right there, in your formative stages, before you're strong enough to be sent, he catches you to try and lead you astray. Today, I hope to keep you on target and to explain what's going on in your life. Because I promise you, every single one of you here, even the littlest of the littlest right there, is going through a process. And we need to recognize it. Mark 14, verses 3 to 10. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of a very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. Hmm. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. Whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you will not always have. Now, the production of perfume was a craft. It was an art. Not everybody could do it. And it was very costly to be able to gather all the fragrances to make that perfume. Not only that, but the container that they used to house that perfume was very, very specific. Those alabaster boxes that they used were as costly sometimes as the perfume that was in it. 
Because it needed to capture the fragrance. Because they used oils and fragrances in the day that they had distilled from plants, it evaporated. It's not like today where they have so many chemicals and so many things that they add to perfumes that they last for years. Not at all. Those perfumes had to be sealed up so that when it was time to use, you used it quickly and then you sealed it up again. So the flask was very particular and it was kept in a cool, dark place. You, you really nurtured that flask. You didn't put that flask up where everybody could see it. You went and you hid it away in your closet so that you could keep the treasure that was inside it. Perfume back then was as pricely as gold. It was as expensive as the most finest purple linens. It was a very rare commodity. They didn't have the technology that we do today. So it was painstaking. And even then, when they began to blend the oils, it had to be somebody who was really gifted in knowing which scents to add to the base of the oil to create the perfect balance. And so we see this picture of Mary coming to Jesus and breaking the alabaster box. This moment where this perfume that was captured in its flask, nobody would have known what its fragrance was. Nobody would have known what was inside it. Nobody would know if the balance was off. Nobody would have known that as that perfume matured in its base oil, if it was masterly put together or not, until that seal was broken. And when that seal was broken, that perfume wafted through the room and everybody could smell that it was a costly perfume. Isn't that interesting? They didn't measure the, the oil. They didn't look at the oil and say, oh, I see you got a Calvin Klein. Oh, I see you got the Gucci. I see you got this fragrance and that fragrance. No, they could smell that this was a very costly perfume. We are the alabaster box. When we come before the Lord and ask him to use us, we have within us rivers of living water. We have within us treasures. We have within us so much potential, but that is the problem. It's all within us. It's all within us. It's all an intention. It's all a hope, an ideal, a vision, a dream, a pattern. And that's all it is. It's an emotion. It's a word that God's given you. And you will not ever experience the power of what's inside of you until the box gets broken. And when you seek God to be used and he begins to transition you from one season to the next. He begins to unwind the seal of the alabaster box. And he begins to break the alabaster box. And that breaking is uncomfortable. That breaking is uncomfortable because you've been in the dark. You've been hidden away. You've been in a secret place. So that you could be nurtured and mature and grow. You're hidden in a closet somewhere. Nobody even knows you exist for such a time as this. And then God reaches into that dark place and he picks you up and he brings you out into the light where everything is uncomfortable. Everything isn't what you're used to. Your environment changes. Your relationship changes. He may even have you move to different states. He may have you change the kind of friends you keep. You may get married. You may get divorced. Something's happening in your life. You're going to go through a shift. And you're like, what happened in my life? I was comfortable. I had my place in the cupboard. I had my place where I knew who I was. I knew what I was made to be. I knew what my potential was. And here I am with all the other vessels on the shelf of God. With hopes and dreams of what I might become one day. And you know what the problem is? We think we're just going to become a bigger alabaster box. We think that God's going to come. And he's going to add more alabaster so that we could get more perfume. We're going to become a bigger alabaster box, thinking that the box that we are is the treasure. You begin thinking that the way that I talk is the treasure. 
How people like me is the treasure. My character is the treasure. How much I've accomplished is the treasure. My metrics are my treasure. You begin to be so pleased with your alabaster box and all the things you're doing for God. And yes, an alabaster box is very valuable. But why is it so valuable? Because of the treasure it holds. The alabaster box was valuable because it was able to contain a valuable oil. And to be able to release that oil, God needs to take us through a breaking process. It is only then that your true fragrance comes out. You, you may have an idea, an intention, but do you really know what's inside of you? You see, you stand the risk for the Lord to break open that alabaster box and it's rancid. Have you ever smelt rancid oil? Have you ever tried to cook with rancid oil? It's nasty. That smell goes through all of your house and you've got to open up the windows and the doors, get stuck to your curtains. You like smell it for weeks afterwards every time you walk in the house and try and fry some chicken in some stale oil is the most disgusting thing ever. Huh? But you'll never know. You'll never know until the box is broken. You see, we can paint up our alabaster boxes. We can make them look beautiful. We can paint them. We can act. We can play dancing bear. We can come to church and worship and harabashata. And we can look like we have it together. We can look very Christian. We're good at that. We're good at looking very Christian, right? And I got it. Hey, I grew up in church. I know how to do Christian. I know how to do church. I was saying to Tom the other, just this morning, actually, as we're doing our podcast, I'm like, legit, bro. I sat in the, mar- in the mirror and practiced my, my smile. I hate what's going on right now. Bless you. Praise you. This is my mirror face. I, I legit had to do it because, you know, my face... Yo, my face says things my mouth doesn't. And my husband was like, baby, your face needs deliverance. (laughs) So I was like, okay. I'm like, it's you and me and this mirror, Jesus. You you better give me uh, a Christian face right now. (laughs) So the people of God don't know what I'm really thinking because they're not ready. (laughs) And so, you know, I know how to paint up a good alabaster box, you know. But let the breaking begin and that mirror face, it slips, y'all. It slips. Let the pressure start to come on me. Let the breaking of the seal begin. Let that little, you know that squeaking sound where you pull a cork out of the bottle? That's me whining as God begins to put pressure situations on me. And my alabaster box is not looking so pretty anymore. It's making these really strange sounds. But we only know when the pressure comes on us. Yeah, my favorite thing is um, when you go through really tough times, a hard loss, a, a bad experience in your relationship, and everybody's got advice. You know, if I was you, you know what I would have done? And you're like, just you wait, buddy. Just you. You know, it, it's like that when, when you have kids, and we were always somehow the first couple to ever have kids. So every single person in the church was like, well, you know, when I have kids one day, You know, your child is so messy. Your child does this. Your child does that. I'm like, you've been married like three days. (laughs) Let me tell you, that couple that had the most advice for us when they had their first child, their house looked like a hurricane. I I, I didn't judge, but I did. (laughs) I hadn't worked on my face yet. you don't know, you don't truly know how you're going to handle a situation until you're in it. Why does God take us through this crushing? So that he can see what you're made of? He's the craftsman. He's the aromatherapist. He's the one that blended the oil in you in the first place. He knows what's inside of you. He knows what you're made of. He put that spiritual DNA inside of you a very long time ago. And you made it a perfect blend. But unfortunately, 
You think that you're a patchouli when really you're a sandalwood. You want to be a rose, but actually you're a jasmine-based perfume. You don't know you. You look at all these beautiful alabaster boxes around you, and you try and bling yourself out to make your alabaster box look like them, thinking that that's what God requires of you. But you will never know who you are until the seal is broken. And let me tell you something. God doesn't just go around breaking seals left, right, and center. God doesn't go around just like, I'm going to smash you, I'm going to smash you, I'm going to smash you, I'm going to smash you. No, ours, our God is a gentleman. He invites us. He invites us into an experience with him. He invites us to pick up the call. He, he woos us. He begs us to pray. He begs us to say, Lord, anything. He puts a desire in our hearts and he begins stirring and he says, ask me, ask me, ask me for more. Ask me to be used of me. Ask me to break free. Ask me. Because if you can ask me, I can show you. But he will not force it in your face until you ask him. And every single one of you sitting here have asked him, Lord, what is my purpose? Lord, what, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? And he says, hmm, you're ready. It's time for me to break the seal on the alabaster box. Because you don't know your potential yet. You will only find your potential when you get broken, child of God. You want to see through. You want to smell through the alabaster box a little bit to see if it's worth breaking the seal. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. If you want to smell a perfume, you've got to spray. You don't just smell it through the container. But that's what you want to do. Lord, is it worth it? Let me see if it's worth it first before I allow those pressures in my life. But you know, he is a good God. If you say yes, he's like, I don't need a second yes. Here we go. So remember what I was speaking about for those of you who were here yesterday, that point of no return? Yeah, you're already. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. It's over for you. You already said yes. God's like, I don't need anything more. Even if you say no now, it's too late. He's like, you know, you may be backing out, but I'm a covenant God. I'm going for it. You know, when you, you go into covenant with him, he's like, you can, you can break. I'm following through. And he will begin to arrange circumstances in your life to bear pressure on you. The first place that he will begin those pressure situations is in your marriage. Oh, we love this part. Oh, it's the best, right? I love it when God does that. Why? Oh, if you want to see a real person, yeah, bring pressure in their marriage. Because that's our safest place to be ourselves. And usually the ugliest part of ourselves. Yeah. By the way, our marriages don't see the best part of ourselves. It's the only place we feel safe enough to let the jerk come out. And oh, it does. You know that squeaking of the uncork? Oh yeah, it usually happens in your marriage. And you want to say, oh, that's just a marriage thing. No, that's a you thing. Your oil is starting to show. What's coming out? What's coming out of your alabaster box? Because there's, there's something beautiful that God's put there. But sometimes what has been put there is also not so beautiful. The first pressure you will face is in your marriage. You'll face it in your family. You will face it in your close circles. In the places where you've got your guard down. Where you can't do the Sunday face. You see, I can't go to bed and I'm going... My husband be like, are you okay? <laughs> like, what? Are you okay? And no matter how much I practice my mirror face, if I come to bed smiling at him sweetly like, he'd be like, the devil is a liar. <laughs> I know the truth. He see through my smile. That's the real me. That's the real ugly. That's the real beautiful. That's the real vulnerable. And God will start there. And we're like, oh my goodness. If they would just get out of my way, I could do the work of God. Hmm. How's that perfume coming along? What are you smelling? 
what's coming out. Whoo, I hadn't have this on the agenda, but God is leading me. Track with me here. I remember Craig and I were going through uh, a really tough time and uh, he was getting very frustrated with me. And he started putting rules and regulations on me to the point where I felt he wasn't allowing me to serve God in some areas. And I, I was like, okay, Lord, you, you've given me this vision. You've called me to go out. You called me to teach and preach. And my husband is literally forbidding me to do these things. Hard to imagine today, but track with me. I never stand up here to teach something I haven't lived. I would never demand for you to pay a price. I've been paid for myself. And he was not being very nice about it at the time either. He can share his own story later. And I was mad at him. I was mad at God. I was mad at the world. I was just mad. And I'm expressive. So I get mad very loudly and very obviously. And I can walk around the house like this. <laughs> and it was actually Nate over here who came and gave me a word of correction. He looked me dead in the eye and he said, oh, so are you telling me God can't use you because your husband won't let you do the work of God? I said, yeah, that's pretty much, you know, that sounds like pretty much it. He said, ah, so you mean to tell me God didn't know? God didn't know that you would be in this situation. God knew you'd be exactly here. God knew that this is the husband you would have. And yet still he gave you the mandate on your life. Do you not think that God is able to pick you up and allow you to fulfill your mandate regardless of what he or anybody else says? Who's your faith in exactly, yourself or your savior? Some stuff that I needed to clear out of that alabaster box that didn't smell like roses, I'm just saying. Seemed there was some, some bitterness in there, arrogance in there, spiritual pride in there that thought I was better. God knew it was there. And I think most of my team could see it there as well because they're all prophets. But you know, there's one person in the room who didn't see it. And that was the point. When I could see it, and take ownership of my oil, whether it was rancid or whether it was beautiful. I could do something about it. And what that meant was die. Yes, I could die. Not just feel sorry for myself. Feeling sorry for yourself and dying is really not the same thing. Feeling sorry for yourself, you're like, okay, fine. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just suck it up. And just, it's okay, I'll just wait for the storm to pass. No, that is having a pity party. That's not dying. Dying is a surrender. Lord, this is what's in me. Lord, this is the ugly. And it doesn't matter how it came up. It doesn't matter who smashed that box. It doesn't matter who uncorked that box. The point is, what's inside? It came out, y'all. Well, if you would just tap the box lightly, perfume would have come out instead of all of this stuff. Are you sure about that? <laughs> Why are you reacting that way? Well, if you just said it nice, I would have reacted nice. Are you sure about that? I don't know. Sometimes people can say nice things and all the junk still comes out because it's in me. It's in me. The ugly is there. The bitterness is there. The pride is there. And none of that can be used in the next season. God needs to get it out and it's ugly. So you better pray to God. He brings it up in your marriage. You better pray to God. He brings it up in your family. You better pray to God. He brings it up in your team. Because if you don't allow him to bring it up in any of those things, he's going to bring it up up here. He's going to bring it up when you have to reach out and lay hands on the sick. You're going to manifest the demon when he needs you to stand up and deliver his people. You're going to break at the wrong time. Because you don't know what you are and are not made of. It's not about what God knows. It's about what you know. Well, you still have so much pride in your alabaster box. You'll never know what you're made of. Never. 
And we all want to smell the perfume. And I promise you, it is there. But it's that which is not perfume. A fly, just one fly in the ointment that makes that perfume rancid. And that's the crushing each one of you are experiencing. We keep looking at the hand of the one who breaks us as the problem. Not what comes out of us when we're broken. That's the problem. And as these pressures are on you, I just want you to stop for a minute and ask, what's my knee-jerk reaction here? Is it insecurity that's coming out? Pride that's coming out? Argument that's coming out? Excuses that's coming out? Every time that pressure comes on you, these are hindrances to your future. You can't afford those things to crop up at the wrong time. So yes, the first place God is going to address it. It's going to be your marriages. So guys, when both of you are in ministry, my heart goes out to you and to you. All these couples here, I'm like, I got you. Because you're both being broken at the same time. And his brokenness, his shards coming at me. I'm like, don't you put your alabaster box near my alabaster box. I'm dying here enough already. And then you're like triggering each other. And it's just a big fat mess and the whole house stinks. It's just really easy if just one of you are going through it at a time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then you get the newly, I remember when you guys were newlyweds when we first met you. I was like, oh, Karabasha, you guys are in for a journey. God is breaking you. <laughs> you made it though. You didn't do too bad. <laughs> But guys, it's when we look at the dying and the breaking process, we keep thinking that we're doing it to get more. And in some ways it's true, but you don't even know what you got now to ask for more. You think you do, but you haven't been broken yet to, to find out what flows out of you, both good and bad. When you're not in control, when you don't have it together, when you don't have the plan, where God sends you where you didn't want to go. You know, I love that about Peter. He was the greatest trailblazer out of them all. Greatest trailblazer. And at the very end, just before Jesus left, he said, one day, one day, Peter, you're going to be taken where you don't want to go. And you're going to be bound and you're going to suffer for me. That is our process, each one of us. So will we allow the Lord to break that alabaster box, each one of us? Will we allow those pressures to come? Because if we do, maybe what comes out at first might not be beautiful. But if you allow him to keep breaking your ideas, your emotions, your will, through these pressure situations, the perfume comes out as well. You don't know the anointing that you truly, truly have until you're broken. You know, I can always tell when I'm around someone that's really broken, truly broken, and is not a humble person. Please, even worldly people can be humble. Who cares? But when you have been humbled by the hand of God, it's a very different thing than just being humble. Being humble means you're a fantastic Christian. Good for you. Even somebody who's been born again for five minutes can begin practicing being humble. But when you have been humbled under the mighty hand of God, it breaks your alabaster box and it releases your perfume. And it doesn't matter if you're anointed. It doesn't matter if you feel good. It doesn't matter if you feel bad. It doesn't matter if the glory cloud is here or not. That perfume is diffused around you everywhere you go. And I can always tell someone that has been broken by the hand of God. I stand next to them for five minutes and I get more downloads of what's going on inside of them than anybody else. 
because they're an open book. They've got nothing to hide. Even their shame, they're like, this is who I am. This is my alabaster box. This is my oil. This is my perfume. What you want me to do about it? Can't make my own oil. Can't make my own perfume. And guess what? You also can't break your own alabaster box privately. It has to be broken from the outside. The alabaster box cannot break itself. It takes the hand of the Father to break that box. All we can do is say, Lord, break me. That's all, that, that's all. You want more? You want the more? Instead of asking for more, how's about you just embrace the capacity you do have and use the oil that's already there that you haven't even tapped into yet? You haven't even begun to tap into the potential you have. What do you want to add more for? The more isn't the problem. You've got an abundance. Listen, you've got the Holy Spirit inside of you. You've got an untapped well inside of you, rivers of living water. But some of you just like a bit of a drip. 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 The scripture says rivers. But when, when people come near you, they get a little drip. That's an alabaster box problem. That's not a God problem. That's not I don't have enough anointing problem. You know, you know we, we're weird. We kind of think like, you got a little bit of anointing. you got a lot of anointing. No, it just depends how broken your alabaster box is that how much perfume can come out. Uh, how about, can we just go back to the fact that the Holy Spirit with all his gifts and all his fruit and all his power is living inside of me. Reverse. There's an untapped supply. The problem is not getting more. You've got all the more you'll ever need. It's the expression of the more that's your problem. And why? Because all you're letting through is a little drop. You have a little crack in the seal. So you're like just dousing a little bit, just a, just a little bit on the, the points there, you know? That's all you got. You don't need more oil. You need more breaking. Because the more you're broken, the more comes out, the more you're crushed, the more you spill and you drip and you splash everywhere. And that's when you know who you truly are. So let us not push back and complain every time these pressures come. This breaking takes form in many different ways. Rejection. Rejection. Are you going to sit and have a pity party? Or are you going to say, break me, Lord. Break me, Lord. Break me, Lord. What comes out of me? Let it be perfume. When you are rejected, what comes out of you? Perfume? Or sulfur? What comes out of you when you're rejected? What comes out of you when you're lied to, cheated on? Push beyond what you're capable of. Asked unfairly to do jobs that are not your jobs. What comes out of you? This is the breaking process. Stop looking at the hand that's breaking the seal. And begin looking at what comes out of you when it's broken. If you can flip the script, it changes everything. Because then you see what you are and are not made of, guys. <sighs> And then you'll do something incredible. You'll embrace it. This, this here, this here is the secret to never becoming complacent, to never sliding back, to ne never getting old, to always growing and growing and going from glory to glory to glory. <laughs> I pride myself and being a better disciple than I am a mentor. Because that's where the power is. That's where the power is. The more I die, the more I'm disciplined, the more I'm broken, the more comes out. I do love a good conviction. I love, I, I, I love those times and I hate those times where, you, where God's about to use you and just before he's about to use you, something happens, pressures come on you, you have a fight with someone or somebody says something that brings up so much pain, so much crushing. You're like, that's just peachy. That's just great. I've got to now get up and minister to God's people. Well, of course, of course, break, break, die. 
empty yourself. That's the time to empty yourself. If this is happening before God uses you, it sounds to me you're exactly where God needs you to be. Because you were going to stand up there with your alabaster box instead of your oil. So you're like, come on, hand over the box. Hand it over. I remember our very first trip to Switzerland. I was terrified. We were were still in our 20s, you know. So obviously we knew everything. We were the best. We were going to come and show them how to do this prophet thing. I mean, duh. We'd only been doing it for three years. That meant like, we knew it all. Had our three little girls with us. And uh, we are on our way to our very first prophetic conference. First time I was ever going to work with a translator. Y'all, I had no idea what I was doing, but I was just, I was so, you know, you're young and you're foolish and you think that the world owes you something. So very precious. And we're like, oh yeah, we're going to go do this. We're going to go do this. And on the way to our first meeting, Craig and I got into the biggest rip-roaring fight we were jet lagged. The kids were crying in the back of the car. I am not a nice person when I'm tired. Craig is not a nice person. When he's tired, we've decided not to talk if we're tired. We just decided, like, this is not even a fight. This is just, you know, we're dream fighting at this point. But it was just one of those situations. We're in a new country. I, I didn't know any, any of the packages of food. So we were hungry because I didn't even know what to buy at the store. Everything was in German. I couldn't read German. I, just, I was just going through a crisis in my life. And now I'm going to go and stand up. We're going to go to minister to God's people. We're driving there and we get into one of those big, rip-roaring, ridiculous, useless fights. You know the kind. Like, why are we here? What are we even doing? And I'm like, well, I thought it was your idea. No, it was your idea. Oh, you never support me. Damn it, damn it. You know. <laughs> and I was sitting there in the parking lot sobbing my eyes out and I'm like great Jesus I gotta get my little self up there we got a couple of hundred people waiting for us and we got these, these fantastic speakers from Mexico, South Africa. They're going to come and teach us on the prophetic because I really had no clue about the prophetic they were some of the ones that had actually come to our first conference in Mexico and I'm like great And he said, die. Dry up those tears. Get out of the flesh. And stand up there empty. Empty. Weak. Useless. Failed. It's just great. I'm going to go stand up there and I just, you know, I'm just the epitome of righteousness. And I just was yelling at my husband all the way to burn. Great, fantastic vessel. Fantastic. I felt so holy, so righteous. Big hot shot, got a lot to teach God's people. Now I like slinked onto that stage, like cut up. You know, during the worship, I was just like flat on my face. They're like, oh, she's really in the spirit. I'm like, I was dying. I was dying. Jesus, I've got to step up there. And now looking around me, I thought I knew what I was going to do, but I had no clue what I'm doing. And it just suddenly just occurred to me after that smashing as that box was broken and the reality starts to hit me. I don't have a clue. He said, that's exactly where I need you. Because I don't need a beautiful alabaster box that knows what she's doing. I need a vessel who will stand there empty so I can fill you up and pour you out again and again in your stupidity. I'm like, if that's what you need, I most certainly qualify. (laughs) That meeting started a revolution in our ministry. It opened up the doors for us to reach four different regions in Switzerland, to plant about 20 churches. They took those prophetic videos that we did and distributed them for years later. It was one of my weakest messages. One of the first times I ever worked with a translator. I didn't know what I was doing. I was a child. An empty, broken child. And I wish to this day that I was still her. Because sometimes I know too much. Sometimes I think too much. Sometimes I think I know the answer before they ask the question. And then God needs to crush me and remind me again of the perfume that is more valuable than the box. 
So if God is emptying you and you feel like you don't have enough to give him, you don't have the anointing, you don't have the grace, you don't have the answers and that nasty character of yours keeps popping up at the wrong time. It sounds to me like you're in the perfect place of being broken to diffuse his fragrance. Don't run away from the pressure. Don't run away from the crushing Go through it. Embrace it. Sob. Cry. Have your five-minute pity party. I told my team, you get five minutes. There's the bathroom. Go feel sorry for yourself. Five minutes. Dry your ears. Come out and get crushed again. Let's go. We're prophets. We don't have time. We don't have time. God's people need the oil we have, not the box we are. So yeah, stop running away from the pressure. And stop being so mad at the hand that uncorks you. That you snatch it back and go back into your hiding place and never release what God put in you. You know, I'm I'm weird because when I learned that so early in our ministry, I run towards correction. I'm like, I need to find more people to correct me. But I'm terrifying, so not a lot of people do. They're kind of scared of what's going to come back at them. To be fair, I don't blame them. (laughs) <laughs> that was you're laughing real loud there, so it's just <laughs> wow. <laughs> My, yeah, Craig's like you didn't hear it from me. You didn't hear it from me because I know that's the secret, guys. I know it's the secret. It's not about what's fair. It's about what's inside of you. And when you're empty and you've got nothing left in your hand, stop saying, add to me, Lord. As if you're going to keep holding what's in your hand and God's going to add to you. No, empty your hands first. And then he can give you something new completely. So I just want to take a minute. I'm watching the time. I got it. Six minutes, to five minutes to go. But I want you to stop fighting the hand of God. Where? Are the pressures coming at you? And it's very easy to spot. They're the ones that pull this uh, out of you. Now you've learned to control that. Uh. <clears throat> you've learned to control that anger. You've learned to control that comeback. You just learned to bite your tongue. Yeah, but you're still fighting. You're not being broken. You're not allowing God to break you. Sometimes that outburst is your breaking. Maybe you need to have that outburst, huh? Maybe you do need to say something. Maybe you do need to have that fight. Because that fight will expose exactly what's inside of you. And you need that. But you've been resisting that pressure that, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. Oh, they just, they they, they don't know what my situation is. And he's always going to do this. She's always going to say that. They're never going to understand what's it bringing out of you. I want you to go to that moment. What's that thing that's pricking you? What's that thing that's pricking you? Come on, y'all. It's time to surrender. Break me, Lord. Can you pray with me? Break me, Lord. Break me, Lord. Break the seal. Break the seal on this alabaster box. You only as precious as your contents. Break me, Lord. Break the shell. Break the shell of my flesh. Break the shell of my intention. Break the shell of what's nice and pretty and everybody appreciates and likes and what I think that they'll want. So I don't care anymore. I want to see as you see. I want to hear as you hear. I want to know as you know. I want to see the treasures you put inside of me. I want to walk them out. So break me, Lord. When that pressure is on you and it hurts and they're fighting with you and it's unfair, especially when it's unfair, especially when it's unfair, especially when you're failing and you just messed up so bad, you feel so humiliated. Don't go and feel sorry for yourself. Say, break me, Lord. Break me, Lord, while you're failing. Don't sit there and then try and figure out why you failed. Then you just need to get broken again from your mind. When you say that, you take the control away from yourself and you put the control in the hand of God. Break me, Lord. Diffuse the fragrance of your perfume everywhere I go. And if that's going to take a broken vessel that is not put together, that doesn't have the right words, that doesn't look very Christian, that doesn't act very Christian sometimes, that doesn't have the perfect marriage, doesn't have the perfect family, doesn't have the perfect lifestyle, that doesn't know how to dress, that doesn't know how to woman, that doesn't know how to man properly, 
Break me, Lord. Let just one thing be perfect in my life. Let it be your perfume. Let them, let them smell your perfume before they see this alabaster box. Let them experience your fragrance in my lowest moments. Isn't that what we're all called to do? Each of us to display an aspect of his nature in this earth. And you'll only know what that is. And you can say, break me. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come, Lord Jesus. Blow your wind over your people. Woo them. For indeed, you hide behind your walls. You hide behind your doors, says the Lord. But I'm wooing you into the secret place. I'm wooing you to where I'm burning incense and a bed of roses that you may come away and know me as you've never known me. But your walls, your doors, your, your anger, your frustration, they resist my hand. My child, I'm not gonna smash through your walls. My child, I'm not gonna break down your door. The key's in your own hand. Would you let me in? Would you, would you let me in as I knock? Would you trust me? Huh. I know the ugly already. Let's talk about it. It doesn't bother me. But come, let the walls down. We have a work to do. And I woo you into my presence, says the Lord. It's only when you've truly been broken that you really know that you know he is in control because in that weak moment you can't pick yourself up you can't anoint yourself your personality won't work you are truly dependent on him it is the most terrifying and most powerful place to ever be. And I pray that each and every one of you experience that again and again and again throughout your walk with Him. Because the more that that happens, the more you diffuse His fragrance in this earth. Amen.